Because how many of you heard the word, obviously, culture before? Yes? Yeah, it happens, it's everywhere, right? It's all over the place. Culture, 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 culture. Culture, we have a culture of this, we have a culture of that. But the problem is, is I believe that there was a Spaniard philosopher who summed this up better than anyone else in the world. <laughs> Does anybody ever feel like that too? You keep saying that word. I don't think it means what you think it means. So how do we find out what culture is? Let me show you a couple of examples of what a culture is. This is what a lot of people will say culture is, right? Uh, how many of you guys have this in your office? Right, we have a culture of fun, culture of accountability, a culture of uh, excitement, culture of customer service. This is not culture. These are byproducts to culture. They're great, we want them, but they are byproducts to culture. Then other people will look at their perks that they get. Now, how many of you are looking at the nap room one all of a sudden and say, who gives a nap room? How many of you guys would like a nap room? All right, so none of you get a nap room. Okay, that's good. So a nap room, uh, actually the Huffington Post is famous for this. Huffington Post, they actually have nap rooms in their office because Ariane Huffington is so focused on making sure people get enough rest that they have nap rooms in there. So you don't have nap rooms, but a lot of people will say, oh yeah, that's the culture of our office. We have these things called perks. Those are not culture. What is a culture? This is a culture. Because a culture, if it's not deliberately designed, will always be dictated by the strongest energy in your office. How many of you, not in the office you currently are in, I understand that, in other offices, you have had people who are Debbie Downers or Billy Bullcrappers. I don't know what you call that guy. <laughs> right? right, but you have people who suck the energy out even though everybody wants to have fun, wants to be good, but there's always that person who loves to commiserate with everybody else in the office. Yes? That's the, that's the culture of your office. If you are not deliberately designing it, they win every single time. So how do you know that that person exists? Give me an amen if this is true. That was a very weak amen. I feel like I'm... How many of you guys believe that to be true? Amen. Right, yeah? Nothing, nothing will ruin a great employee faster than watching you tolerate a bad one. And you've all been in that situation before. You guys, we have to change the way we talk about our team members and not our staff, by the way. If any of you heard me speak before, you know I do not use the word staff. A staff is an infection nobody wants. You're either a team that wins or you're a team that loses. You are creating superstar teams full of advocates or you are just filling people in role and in tasks, not roles. If you hire for a task, you will create enslavement. If you hire for a role, you will create freedom. That's the difference between a great employee. How many of you guys have had a situation where you had a really, really, really good team member or employee, and someone was working next to them that was, let's just say, they were an A employee and the other person was a C employee. They did their job, but they were just kind of doing it. Anybody have that? Well, here's what's very fascinating about this, psychologically. When you have an A player surrounded by even one C player, that C player will automatically drop the A player's work down to a B. They cannot stay in A because psychologically they watch it. I, have, I love it. I have so many, I have Debbie, Best, Debbie Best and Carol and everybody shaking their heads because they're sitting there, they're in the offices like, yep, we've seen it over and over again, right? It's so true. You have to be willing to improve your culture by step number one. You want to know what step number one is? Fire the low hanging fruit. The fastest way to increase your culture is to fire the people who are not, not a fit, who you are not a fit for. I want to say that again. It's not about them not being a fit. It's about you not being a fit for them and what they want. That person who wants to take time off because of fill in the blank, who wants to come in late because of fill in the blank, that person who doesn't want to participate because of fill in the blank, there's nothing wrong with them choosing that. We have got to get out of the mindset that they're wrong or bad or jerks or whatever. It's not. It's 
that you're just not a fit for what they need, and that's okay. Here's my example I usually give is this. If you walk in in the morning, and let's, is anybody named uh, Sally in the room? No, nope, not middle name, but I don't want to offend you, and I don't, because I'm going to not be pleasant to Sally in just a moment. <laughs> is there any Sally in the room? All right. Sally walks in, doctor, me, hey Sally, how's it going? And she says, hi, good morning doctor, and you say good morning, and as you walk by you think, boy, I wish you'd quit. <laughs> that's the test. Honestly, that's the test. You don't need to go through all the process, that's the test. Because you are out of integrity with Sally. If you truly love Sally, you would let her go. If you truly loved Sally, you would even if, even if she's mad, even if she's a really nice person down deep, even if she's got 20,000 kids and she's got to feed them on her own, it doesn't, what all your excuses are, it doesn't matter. If you truly love her and you have that thought, you've got to let her go. Yes? Turn to somebody next to you, give them a high five, say, you're awesome. Turn to someone else, say, I know you're awesome, but I'm amazing. <laughs> so this is your trigger. When you see this slide pop up through the rest of my presentation, even if I don't say it, turn to your neighbor, give my five, say they're amazing, they're awesome, whatever. This is your trigger. You must create triggers in your office so you continually raise the energy in the room. What happened right there? After me saying that, there's a, little, there's a lot of head nodding and a lot of like, I'm not going to point, point and look at anybody, but yes, you're totally right, Dino, right? There's a lot of that, I get it. And it brought down the energy a little bit, just like in your office. Fastest way, what happened to the energy right there? Up, right? You are in control of your energy. You are in control of your energy. And we, there's a great uh, teacher. Anybody know Brendan Burchard? Anybody heard of him? He's a great teacher, a great mentor. He actually has a saying that I love. It says, you, uh, power plants do not have energy. They generate energy. You do not have energy. You must generate energy. If you're feeling sluggish in the day, that's no one's fault but your own. You have every way to control that. High-fiving people, giving people compliments. We heard earlier today, just telling somebody how awesome they are. And remember that time when they were awesome and walking away. Wasn't that a great presentation? I had to hear little parts of it. But you guys, like, it's on you. All right. So let's go with culture. Here's what culture is. Culture is the magnification of a personal belief or commitment when joined with others who share the same belief or commitment. Let's give you some examples. Who said this? Disney. Well, Disney. He wanted to create the happiest place on earth. He, literally the story is this. Walt was at uh, Griffith Park, which is about two and a half hours away from here. He was at Griffith Park with his two daughters at the carousel, and he saw it was dirty, and it wasn't really fun for parents too. So he went, hmm, I wonder if there could be a place where parents could have fun, and it could be clean, and we can be there all day long. Hmm, that was the spark of Disneyland. That's how Disneyland started. And he wanted to create the happiest place on earth. So he had a commitment and belief that we could create this. Even though many people told him no, he went bankrupt a few times. They thought it was crazy. But then he finally found a group of people who said, yes, we want to create the happiest place on earth too. And that's when Walt created it. And then what happened? People flooded his office. People flooded his business. Now, he's created it so strong that all those people in there, what are they wearing? Can you see that, what they're wearing? Ears. The Mickey ears, right? Here's a place where we as adults will go to, get Mickey ears on, put our names on the back, and walk around all day long like no big deal. <laughs> right? And, and you, want, you somebody walks by and you're like, yep. <laughs> but if that same person was walking in front of your office right now today, you'd be like, what a freaking weirdo. <laughs> right? Because it's not in the confines of Disneyland. All right, who's this? Apple, Bill Gates, right? Think different. He said, think different. Did he get people to uh, join him in that belief and that commitment? Yeah, people camp outside for a phone they're going to pay $1,000 for when they probably are living in some of those tents, some of those people, right? Who they can't afford it, but they'll pay for it. 
because he wanted them to believe that if we just thought different and gave a great product, sleek and sexy, and we wanted to really help people have new technology, people would join him. All right, who's this? That's always the tough one. Who? Huh? I think I heard it. Oprah, Oprah Winfrey, that's right. Did she get people to join her in this belief? Yeah, she got like people who are all on board with the crazy, right? Like, oh my gosh. Some of you run to get the My Favorite Things magazine, right? Like you can't wait to see it. She's created a culture around live your best life, no matter where you're from, no matter what your upbringing is, no matter how hard things were for you, you can overcome it. That's a culture. So this is what I mean when I talk about being deliberately designed. A culture is a magnification of a personal belief or commitment when joined with others who share the same belief or commitment. So what's your belief? What's your commitment? By the way, many people think I'm talking to doctors here. And partly I am. Because they're the leaders. They're the ones who open the doors to a business. But what about your homes? What about with your children? Do they know what you are committed to and what you believe? Have you been able to enroll them in that? See, it's not just about what's happening inside your office. I tell people all the time, I have zero interest in creating better employees. Zero. For me, that just sounds so boring. What I do is I want to elevate your life outside, have you have better marriages, be better parents, be better siblings, be better friends, be better citizens, and you will automatically bring it inside, and we're good. Make sense?